Hello, welcome to the Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge podcast. I'm Michael Bott. And I'm Rupert Soskin. Uh, yes, welcome. Yes, and we are collectively known as the Prehistory Guys, as if you didn't know. Look, we're on a bit of a mission right now, and that's to fulfil the promise we made when we set out to make a series of films which we're calling Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge. It's what this podcast is piggybacking off. And um, I think it's fair to say it's our passion project right now. Uh, we'll say a, a bit more about the actual film thing in, in a moment. But right now what's important is, to, is, is what to expect in this show that you've clicked through to listen to or watch. To cut to the chase... Uh, as the first steps in making Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge. A few weeks ago, Rupert and I spent three days at Gobekli Tepe with access to the whole site. We've been down amongst the tea pillars. We've seen the places where the people lived. We've been on, we've seen excavations that are normally way out of the public eye, much, much more, all in the company of one of the lead archaeologists there, Dr. Lee Clare. So that is what this show is about. We, we so had our minds blown during our visit, mm. and we got so much to share with you. And this is the first opportunity, probably the first of many we've got so much, to talk about what we've taken away from our visit. So mm. best thing is to strap in. There's quite a lot to get through. <laughs> um, yeah. bef before we do start out on that, Say a few words about uh, the actual Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge project itself, Rupert. Uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> well, it's a massive project, isn't it? It's huge. Um, in a nutshell, Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge is a series of films exploring how people progressed from being sedentary hunter-gatherer groups to larger, more established farming communities. And uh, it, it might not sound all that glamorous talking about farming, but the, <laughs> but the point is it's the embedded lifestyle that comes from working the land that enabled communities to become civilizations. It's just such a massive part in the development of, uh, of human life. So, I mean, for example, the things that we'll be exploring, how did the practice of farming influence the way societies developed over time? Uh, trading across great distances, you know, particularly the huge trade in obsidian, especially from the Aegean spreading throughout the Mediterranean and into Northern Europe. You know, how did we ultimately become the megalith building societies that culminated in some of the most famous sites like Stonehenge standing proud on the Salisbury Plain? That's what we do. Yeah, that one. I mean, that, that's... Yeah, well, that's the point about doing the series, is isn't it? I mean, it not only tells that story, but takes us to some extraordinary um, places, you know, that people might not otherwise uh, get to. So it's our job, you know, to take you on that journey. That's what we're uh, planning with these series of films, and uh, this podcast is, you know, as I said, springing off the back. This particular one springing off the back of our three days at Gobekli Tepe. It's the first stages, mm. so. As we've done the, that, you know, we've done that bit of filming. <clears throat> the results of that are not out, except there will be tremendous loads of content that we can produce beside the film yeah. from uh, the content we produce. Look forward to that. Um, but the point is we've still got loads more to do. So the, this bit we've done has already been funded uh, by kind folk who have helped us uh, via our Buy Me A Coffee, Coffee campaign. So... Um, We'd like to invite you just to take a look at the uh, Buy Me A Coffee page link through, t click through the link in the description below to see, um, you know, what we're up to in more detail and uh, uh, consider helping us uh, produce the rest of the, the series as we, we go. We'd be much obliged if you did so. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, enough said about the uh, the, the project uh, as a whole. Bear in mind as we go through, as Rupert and I talk, that uh, this is primarily a, a, a podcast and there won't be maps and supporting images and, and, and video uh, as we go through. Um, we've That's not to say we haven't got any, we've got <laughs> loads. So if you want that part of it, you know, we, we've, we've got... Uh, Oh, about seven hours that needs to be whittled down for yeah. you know, which will 
uh, get compressed and uh, and compiled and put on several um, items on YouTube. Several bits of content we'll be putting out on YouTube over the coming weeks and months. So look out for that. Okay, enough. Let's begin. Let's <laughs> take you as far as we can through the yeah, power of description and uh, and and words to uh, Gobekli Tepe it, itself. I suppose. A good place to start is, is at the beginning, and on the um, uh, first morning that we arrived at Gobekli Tepe, and we were walking up the ramp, kind of thinking we knew what to expect, <laughs> maybe, but <clears throat> open for uh, open for for anything. Mm. What are your memories? Of it? Well, it, it it it's like any major site, isn't it? That it doesn't matter how many photographs you've seen and how much you've read, nothing actually prepares you for. Uh, being in the shared space and um, it's also funny how you become so blinkered you know I mean walking up that uh, you know that wooden trackway to get up to the site uh, actually oblivious to what we were walking past uh, which we we will talk about later but just this blinkered thing yeah. And getting well, as was as would most of the public be and there's a lot of public tr walk up up that, uh, Do you know, track, I, I that think uh, path, the, I think yeah. the thing there though is that bearing in mind what we do, you know, this is what we do, and uh, and, yeah. and we always have an eye for the detail that people usually miss. That is what we do, and so when mm. when you have uh, you know the hordes of tourists, so many tourists arriving who. They are just coming up and looking at these, uh, in, you know, the special buildings. They seem to be utterly oblivious to everything that's going on around it. Um, so, mm. you know, talking about that first experience, in many ways, similar for us, that we would just we were just itching to get that first view of the site itself, and it does just take your breath away uh, on so yeah. many levels. Not least of all, the scale of it. Uh, I was not prepared no. for, you know, again, doesn't matter how many photographs you've seen, I was not prepared for how big those T-pillars are in mm. uh, in Building D. Uh, I, just, I just couldn't believe yeah. what I was looking at, really. Mm. And the, the canopy that's been built over it, you know, to uh, A, protect the site, uh, and B protect the uh, uh, the, the tourists yeah. uh, and the walkway around the major the main excavated area. You know, it's quite spectacular. Mm. Hats off to the design and uh, everything like that. I think <clears throat> uh, same way you, you were. It's not just the size of the site, but the depth. And the fact that these the four main special buildings uh, are so sunken down mm. uh, into the ground, so you're you're looking down quite away from those those walkways, yeah. and also conscious of the hill rising up behind. Oh, what failed to mention is, of course, the other surprise walking up there too is the uh, the elevation. And the uh, distance you can see, mm. it's uh, it's quite a way up. It's not any just any old hill, uh, the pot belly pot belly pig hill thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, is it? You know, it's already got an elevation to it by the time you've driven up there, yeah. and so the 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 view all around is quite quite spectacular. Mm. It is. Sorry, I thought you were going to say something else. You you interrupted yourself to say that. And I thought you were going to say something else. Uh, no, it's absolutely true. Oh, and I, I think an interesting yeah. point, and in fact, a point that Lee made. You know, he's pointing out across the landscape and uh, and showing that, you know, Karahan Tepe is over there, and uh, you know, just pointing out different sites that that you um, the people at the time uh, would have been very aware of all the different communities. Uh, across the landscape they would all have known you know where mm. they were whether it was you know seeing the smokes from each other's fires or or what have you they would have been very very aware of uh, of their kind of wider community if you want to put it that way so that was the first kind of yeah you know, jaw drop moment mm -hmm. um, we, we, 
yeah, you get your eyes opened to what you're actually dealing with. But I think there was a, a second jaw drop moment as we made our way uh, up to the the uh, the higher bit towards the north uh, northwest, the back end uh, uh, of there. And uh, of course, most people's gaze as they're walking around the the walkway is inward, mm. and the inward edge of, uh, over the inward edge of, of the walkway down into the uh, T pillar sites, into the special buildings. But when we got up to the higher end there, um, uh, my memory is that uh, Lee instantly drew our attention to outside the walkway, looking up the hill, and immediately, with almost within arm's reach mm. um, of the walkway, he pointed out several domestic areas, yeah. lived in areas, worked in 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 areas, um, and not many people turn around to to look at. Then. Mm. So I suppose the first topic, the first eye eye opener, <clears throat> is putting to rest this idea um, that Gebekli Tepe uh, was just a place that came people came to uh, just to do whatever you do in a so called temple, mm. um, you know, for religious ceremonies. This is what it's been sold to uh, to us as for quite some time now. And yet, and yet, and yet, the evidence for people living there in the settlement is overwhelming. And uh, I think we didn't realise how in your face that evidence actually is mm. once you look. Is that yeah? Is that about right? Really? Yeah, I, I mean, in, in fact, whilst the special buildings are astonishingly impressive and all of that, it's it's the the residential stuff that I found far more profound um that that you're you're looking at all the signs of people's daily lives over mm. massive massive periods of time uh, you know when you can see repair work in a dry stone wall and the repair work includes a broken grinding stone or uh, you know broken portal mm. stones things like that where it was too useful a piece of stone to throw away so they've actually incorporated it into a piece <laughs> of repair work in a wall now uh, you know grinding stones how long does it take to wear through a grinding stone or to break a grinding stone it's a huge amount of time uh, so you're you are you're looking at just generations and generations of people living in these places uh it, it it was remarkable for both of us wasn't it when we were walking around the site uh, looking mm. at just how many broken pieces of stuff uh, whether it was grinding stones or portal stones or worked stones that you couldn't tell what they had been uh there's one particular yeah. uh, wall in room 38 i remember that uh, that it looks oh, yeah. like uh and it looks like an entire stone bowl is in the wall and it's sort of i don't know half a meter diameter it's enormous and obviously it's broken and you can only see the perfectly rounded face uh you know that that you can see the rest of it is is in the wall but it, it was that level of just gosh how how much stuff uh, i mean there's the uh, lower down from the residential buildings uh, the, the archaeologists call it the stone garden because they didn't <laughs> they didn't know what to call it it's basically where yeah. they've where they've been clearing surface stuff and they've just pulled away all these broken pieces of quern stones grinding stones and, uh, and what have you and they put them all in rows in this field area that they call the stone garden and there's like 10,000 grinding stones and yes. <laughs> and, and see, I, i'm looking at that and i'm going good grief 10,000 grinding stones and, and and lee said yeah but that's not a lot of grinding stones for a couple of thousand years of <laughs> people living somewhere and, and from that point yeah. of view absolutely true it's it's not but the point is that that's what they've found uh, you know, you you, so you really you can't forget underneath all of this. You can't forget that they've only excavated sort of five six percent 
of uh, of the entire site. Lord only knows what re- and, is underneath the rest of it. And what a different perspective. And what a different perspective people would have, because the the stone garden, uh, you know, as you said, is the you know one of the first thing. Well, it's the first things you see after you if you've driven up there in your bus yeah. to take you to the site. And it looks like a a, a a field full of rubble. Yeah. Off to your left as you walk it, walking up. So probably don't people don't pay that much attention to it. But ten thousand quernstones and grinding stones <laughs> in, in a field tells you a lot that you need to know about the site before you yeah. you get up there. It's not all about uh, out, about tea pillars. Yeah. All right, uh, good point. I can see this kind of, you know, what we're going to say is we'll unfurl in kind of the order that was, it was unfurled to us during our, our three days. And I think I'll sort of rush ahead and say it wasn't until the second day that we actually went down into the special buildings mm. amongst the tea pillars and all the other detail uh, with Lee. So... Yeah, I mean, that was our first Im- impression, and and picking uh, and standing on the walkway and picking out all the, all the details, you know, and where they were, and you know how beautiful they they are, and how much detail and variety and the elevation and the uh, and the geog- geography of the, of the site and uh, every you know the, the the room's relationships the head explodes with so many questions mm. that was the first thing it it wasn't just the uh, impression of the depth and size but there's so much detail that you know you, the question after question after question after mm. question why is that wall there you know how come uh, that carving is half covered by that wall mm. just uh, Myriad, they kept uh, pouring out. Mm. Yet it wasn't until until the next day that we went down am- amongst them to you know to get more personal with it. Yeah. Um, but what was revealed to us on that that first day is just the sheer extent uh, of the size of the settlement as a whole, and the amount of excavation that's been done on the domestic areas. Mm call them domestic areas you know that's these are not you know this is not these are not the special buildings these are uh, cells small c- cells some larger than uh, others that extend up the hillside you know what you could call uh, legitimately call a tell site because it's developed yeah, and it's and got higher it and higher really. over 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 time it is a tell hmm. um uh, containing mostly uh, domestic buildings with evidence of people living uh, with evidence of of lived lives uh, among them, mm. um, uh, and it's astonishing that the meme of uh, Gobekli Tepe has survived so long as merely being a uh, a, a temple. Yes. So we were treated to um, having a look at those uh, excavations, which are quite extensive, up to the northwest of the site, and over, just over the other side of the uh, of the tell. So you're looking out over another vast landscape escape over the other side of the hill. Um, there's another excavation, uh, two major excavation sites, one with a great sort of spaceship like <laughs> covering uh, to it representing years of excavations and some of the excavations you know have not been touched for quite a long time because you can only do so much at one time i think the main excavation uh, focus is back in the uh, in the main in the special buildings yeah. now and, and the the uh, the domestic areas have, have been um uh, uh, not quite so under the under focus or um Although it's one of major uh, Lee's major interests, of course. But what do you remember uh, on that first day? He was showing us those excavations that are un- under the cover. Um, what the northwest excavations? The northwest west yeah. excavations. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> standout moments for you. Well, well, but there was a series of them because uh, you know we were just following Lee, and he said, "Yeah, we're going this way," and so we stepped, you know, over the barriers around the main part of Quebecly Tepe, where you know, where as a as a tourist, as a visitor, that's where you'd go. So he took us across these rope boundaries, and then through this gate, and through an olive grove, 
And at the back of the olive grove, there were the archaeologists' cabins, what they use as their offices. And then you carry on walking past those. And then suddenly out there on the landscape is, as Mike just said, this vast UFO of a cover over the excavations in the northwest region. Uh, now, that was a surprise to begin with. But then yeah. going down into these excavations and, number one, seeing the amount of tea pillars that, uh, that, that they've uncovered – and some pretty sophisticated uh, stonework that's clearly for irrigation, but these are, um, you know, these are by no means finished excavations. They've just withdrawn from those to focus on the main area. But then stepping out from underneath the cover into there's a, an area to the north of that. I mean, literally just to the side of it, but uh, but to the north where you can see that Lee pointed out, you, you, you see that boulder there, and you're looking at this boulder yeah. on the surface, and, yeah, that's the top of another T-pillar. So, so, <laughs> so, so you, you stand on the ground there with your foot on this T-pillar, knowing that, mm -hmm. looking at the scale of or the dimensions of, of the stone that is sitting proud of the ground, and knowing that, well, yeah. if that's like the one's in the main area, then you're going four or five metres under your feet is the floor. Um, and it's it's just yet more uh, special buildings. And if it's yet more special mm. buildings, that means inevitably yet more residential buildings. Um, mm. I mean, that, that was the main thing there. I think this is probably a, a, a good time to point out something else that Lee showed us was uh, they've done some ground penetrating radar and, uh, and underneath the site where the archaeologists' cabins are, literally under your feet when you're standing there, are more special buildings. And, mm. uh, and because... <clears throat> you can tell from the excavations that have been done that the domestic buildings are on the higher ground and the special buildings are in the dips. So you go down to the special buildings. So you look out across the 20 hectares of, uh, of, of this uh, hill and, and you look at the undulating landscape you know, th this bit of upland and this bit mm. of downland. And, yeah. and so you can just imagine what's going on underneath the soils there of just, you know, how many houses and special buildings are, are all there to be excavated. That it's just it's not going to happen in our lifetimes. I mean, it's decades and decades and decades of work. Of, of archaeological work, because uh, only, what, 5 to 6% of the entire site has been excavated so far. Yeah. And that's o over how many years? Oh. Since it was, I mean, it's just... It's half, the, the, half a century, isn't it? Yeah. So it's that scale thing. Is there enough, you know, archaeological will and money to... Yes. Uh, excavate not just Gebekli Tepe, but you know the the other Tepe sites that have been uh, discovered uh, laterally. Do you know, you, uh, not you, least you, of which. you're talking about what you know. What, what were the uh, mind blowing moments? And I think one of the biggest yeah. shockers of all was uh, because you know we've we've learned about a lot of the Tash Tepe sites, so other T pillar type sites. Uh, in the region, you know, there's a, there's a good number that are known about now, but uh, but Lee said that in recent field surveys, they've identified hundreds. That, that is the, the word that he used: hundreds of other sites. Now that doesn't mean mm. to say that they're all T pillar sites. Some of them can be just basic encampments, but the point is they've identified the locations of hundreds which means that a good number of them are going to be more T-pillar sites. And uh, if you've got such a sort of a bustling regional network, if you want to put it that way, uh, I don't think it's unreasonable to put it in those terms, then 
it says so much about how people's lifestyles, how how settled they were in the way they lived. Okay, this is pre-farming, yeah. but the fact that they had these really sophisticated settlements from which they would, you know, they would go out and they would hunt and forage and gather and, and whatever, but they were living in these yeah. very, very settled communities for a very, very, yeah. very long time. And the fact that they've identified the locations of hundreds more is just staggering. Yeah. It's worth pointing out, you know, that uh, standing on the, these sites, uh, both the uh, Gebekli Tepe and Karan Tepe, as we did later on, um, it, viewing those uh, landscapes around them uh, as massive resources that would enable them to be settled mm. for a long time. We've talked about this in the previous podcast, obviously, uh, um, in, in n number one, where we talked about the 10,000 years before Gebekli Tepe. Um, people had uh, got it nailed as to how to exploit the landscape around them uh, to such an extent uh, and have control of it that they were able to settle. They didn't need to be farmers, they just needed to be exploiting every last inch mm. or uh, available resource that their landscape was providing to them. And that's why the you know the Fertile Crescent is called the Fertile Crescent for a very good reason, mm. because depending, climate dependent, um, and there were ups and downs during the period, but climate dependent, um, <clears throat> it was just that. It provided those resources mm. from uh, gazelle to the wild or semi-wild cereals that there would be... Um, you know, you don't have a grindstone if you don't ain't got something to grind. <laughs> no. So although no. they may not have, you know, uh, got the control of, of wheat and emmers and, and barley and, and stuff under control, they uh, certainly got it down how to harvest the, the wild uh, cereals that were being presented to them. Mm. So a combination of uh, gazelle hunting, uh you know any other kind of uh, hunting um they got it ha they got it nailed yeah um the broad spectrum diet they yeah. there you go well i, I think um, it's it, it, you know it, it, it bears repeating because i'm pretty sure we said it last time but um one of the uh, the real standout details of, uh, so there's Bonchuklutala, which is not that far away, which literally translates as the field of beets. And mm. uh, and the same applies at Gebekli Tepe, that in the northwest uh, excavations where uh, the public don't go, uh, that one of the areas under that northwest uh, canopy, they found a phenomenal amount of beads. And the point about that, the reason that that's such an important point, is that you don't sit around making jewellery unless you've really got your lifestyle well under control. It's not how you spend yeah. your time if you're desperate trying to uh, eke a living out of the landscape. You've got to be very settled to be really spending a lot of time on putting fancy stuff around your neck, really. Yeah. And you don't bother putting in waterways and irrigate and uh, start controlling and harvesting, you know, the aquifers and the, and the uh, water channels around you, the natural flow of water off the hill around you. And uh, in the northwest excavations, there is, in just one corner of it, there's an enormous um, deep, Water can only be interpreted as a as a water system, yeah. Uh, with channels, deep channels in the uh, limestone, covered channels mm. in the limestone, which can only be interpreted, you know, as some kind of running water control, yeah, uh, within uh, that area. And an important so point that you've stunning. made there that Going, uh, covered. Uh, that's the point that the this yeah. these water channels were covered with uh, with uh, slabs. So, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're going to significant lengths to keep that water clean as it comes through, you know. it's uh, And also, mm -hmm. you know, when you said in the corner, 
of the excavations, it's important to also uh, understand that that's in the corner of the excavations. Yeah, that's the that's, that's as far, yes, that's that's as, far as they've dug. <laughs> Uh, you know, so yeah. so how sophisticated those uh, irrigation channels become, we can only guess, really. Yeah, yeah. That's the right part of the uh, of the settlement. You know, if you're bringing water back up the hill, because there's a catchment area just down the hill where there is uh, ground out ponds and pools and 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 uh, water control uh, channels of. Uh, uh, all, uh, quite a few varieties that you can see, and that's how, you know that's a large part of the time on that first day was actually spent exploring uh, that area just to the north and northwest and mm. west of, of of the hill, you know where it's clear, you know that they were interacting with the the landscape and uh, and extracting what they could from it. Um, you know, before what, what, I leave that point, yeah. Sorry, just just before I leave that point, I'm just reiterating. Uh, once you stand there and see the extent of the landscape, it's no surprise that a group of people this size could persist from exploiting that yeah. amount of landscape because yeah. it was fertile then. There was much more. The, the climate was different. Was more wooded and and although there's still the open bits, um, yeah, lush. there was a lot more going on. Yeah. Lush. That's it. Was yeah. lusher. If that's a word, <laughs> it's more lush. <laughs> you know, one, one of the other uh, real wow moments um, up there was when Lee took us walking out across the plateau. Uh, so basically the uh, the area that is immediately to the north of the sites that, you know, that, that the public get to see. Uh, so we're walking out across the plateau and he was showing us uh, these various quarry sites where they'd uh, extracted building mm. material. And amazing how many cut marks. Uh, so, you know, where, uh, you know, these bowls, if you like, have been ground into the rock surfaces. They're all over the place. But the the real shocker was when Lee took us to... Uh, a quarry area where there is a T pillar that's it's mm. broken. It's on its side. It's quite likely that it broke when they were extracting it. If there was a flaw in the in the rock and it and it just split when they were taking it out. But this T pillar is is when it's lying down on the ground. <laughs> you really get a sense of how huge it is, don't you? This enormous yeah. thing, and you think, God, they must have been spitting. Feathers when that snapped, <laughs> when they were levering it yeah. out. Yeah. There's a lot of work to dig that. Here's a really important point that you know shouldn't be just be uh, o overlooked: is that um, this limestone bedrock, uh, and it's it, it it's a hard job to hack out T pillars or any sort of rock, you know, shaped from uh, limestone bedrock. But it's relatively easy. And so when we think about these T-pillar sites, mustn't forget that they're dependent on the availability of the basic work building materials, if you like. So the absence of uh, T-pillars in other parts of the world or in other parts of the, <laughs> the Levant, you know, or, or uh, you know, the whole of the fer Fertile Crescent, it doesn't mean that people were living any less sophisticated lives. It just didn't mean that they were living on a limestone plateau uh, <laughs> mm. you know, with with these things readily available to pry out of the ground. Uh, the analogy is on uh, Orkney, where we still have stone buildings extant because they had stone to build out that the uh, uh, build uh, stuff. The uh, they were prizing their building materials out of the uh, the rock beneath their their feet and mm. it's 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 not common it's rare so mm. um just trying to you know make sure people remember that the t pillar sites are dependent on geology they're not just yeah. something well, magical it, uh, and it's, you know, it's because a, people it, thought it'd be a good idea at the time yeah and it's it's a valid point to make as well that you know when you you look at the just the mindset, the thought processes that go into 
uh, that sort of construction, that mm. if what you have available is timber instead of stone, then yeah. uh, you know, you're just as capable of making something equally sophisticated out of timber, but it's not going to stay in the archaeological record. Um, mm. uh, and th that could apply to almost anywhere you care to mention where there, where there aren't megalithic sites uh, left to be seen and, uh, and so it looks like mm. this complete void in human history but that's pretty much all it means it's just no they were just using yeah. timber uh, absolutely and th there's one site that is uh, considered a progenitor site um, for Gebekli Tepe and other T-pillar sites and that's uh, Chakmak Tepe um, which yeah. we wanted to visit because I wanted to see the post holes in the ground. <laughs> and yes, I wanted to bring yes. back a, a film of that. We, di we didn't uh, do that. Um, but it seems that at Chakmak Tepe, you know, it's a, it's a similar kind of site, but they were using timber before they used uh, T-pillars to support uh, the roofs. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Do you know what? Down in Building E, which we haven't mm -hmm. mentioned yet <laughs> at Gbekli yes. Tepe, there is a post, post hole in uh, on the circumference there, and yeah. I was very tempted to... I think I've got uh, some yeah. sh shots of that. Where, Do you know, where, you know, timber. I tell you what, we haven't mentioned. We yes. haven't mentioned talking about T pillars. Yes. And of course, people think about freestanding things, mm. and all the time, you know, uh, and the illustrations, and all the time we're looking at them. We, I think, I was doing in my mind. I'm, I presume you were doing in yours. We were working out how the roof was supported by yeah. these uh, T pillars as well. Yeah. Perhaps we should talk about that, uh, you know, in the, in the um, uh, under the umbrella, as it was, of our second day when we actually did get to go down uh, <laughs> amongst the T pillars themselves mm -hmm. uh, with Lee. Do you want to say a word about why, you know, why we were going down? Because it was a very special purpose to being down amongst there. For, well, for it, Lee, it, anyway, it, yeah. it, it, it was, although, I mean, obviously we were going down to photograph inside the special buildings anyway. Anyway, but yeah. uh, But the thing is that during... Um, this year's excavations, so 2023, during this year's excavations, they uncovered a stunning set of, uh, of sculptures, uh, one in particular in Building D. That It's quite funny that when they finished the excavations, the previous excavation season, they... You know, if they had only known that, uh, that you know, just <laughs> two, two inches below the last trowel dig uh, was, the, was the top of this amazing sculpture of a wild boar, yeah. uh, which uh, we, uh, we've promised that we won't uh, show pictures of it just yet because the Turkish authorities are quite jealous about they want to be the first people to put it out to the world, which is fair enough. So we've promised that we won't put it out uh, just yet until they say that it's all right to do so. But the thing is that this sculpture of a wild boar uh, it's it must weigh half a ton. Uh, I mean, it's 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 you know it's pretty much a life size wild boar, not quite, but nearly. Yeah. And the thing is that it's still got paint on it. Its yes. its mouth inside its mouth is red, and on its underside you can still see it's black. And uh, and obviously most of it on the upper surfaces uh, it's eroded away over ten thousand years, but. But the fact that it's coloured, that it's painted, it, you you can you can then look around the rest of the site and go, oh, <laughs> this might have been yeah. quite colourful in here, um, and uh, that it, it's details like that that give you uh, a completely different perspective on what the site may or may not have looked like. You, you see another aspect: these tiny little details uh, that all around the site. There are so if you if you imagine um, the four sides of a, of a of a rectangular pillar, and they've drilled a hole diagonally through a corner, uh, so that you could tie something to it, uh, and so all around the site there are these drilled holes going through pillars and slabs, where, I mean, we can only guess at what they were. Uh, hanging, but it's most likely 
Is it fair for me to say that? Probably not. Mm. Uh, I, I think it's quite likely that they were hanging furs and fabrics from these uh, from these points. Um, and so obviously, fair, you know, again, yeah. textiles wouldn't stay in the archaeological record. Got no idea what they might have been. But the thing is, they were tying mm. stuff uh, all around the place. Um, mm. And I would imagine from the amount of instances of foxes being carved all through the site there's loads of foxes all over the place mm. uh i would imagine that fox fur and fox pelts were pretty ubiquitous a thing, a thing yeah mm. the striking thing about going down into particularly building d for the first time and standing with our own feet on the stone floor which is the bedrock by the way it's the, yeah. it's the chiselled out bedrock to form that uh, that floor is the sense of space mm. the pillars are flipping high yeah and even imagining a roof on it, uh, it, it i wouldn't say it's it's not quite cathedral like space but it has a sense of airiness about it i don't know how light or dark it would have been back in the day once it had a roof on and very little light coming in but the sense of airiness in that space was just uh, quite extraordinary yeah quite yeah. extraordinary i expected it to be really quite tight and you know sort of claustrophobic but no it's isn't uh, that an interesting thing it's in, not. in fact um it's probably a um, a good comparison to make that you go to Karahan Tepe and mm. Karahan Tepe has um, an enclosure, let's call it a room, a building, uh, where the floor space is is vast. It's bigger, isn't it? You, know, you, it you, bigger. you said cathedral-esque. I, I mean, it's, I, I think it's fair to say cathedral-esque. Now, the, the difference, uh, the, the fundamental difference between Karahan Tepe and Gebekli Tepe is that Gebekli Tepe had the constant slip of the hill uh, and uh, and if you look at the main floor area that it's I don't think it's unreasonable to uh, to imagine that the original floor space was probably as vast as it is at Karahan Tepe. Yes, good point. But as mm. the hill kept on slipping down and they had to keep on making repairs and they were bringing walls inwards because that was the best way to deal with the slippage of the hill was just to make the room slightly smaller so that mm. essentially you could make the wall as a revetment to hold the slope back. And, and they yeah. had to keep on doing that over centuries and centuries it was just running repairs the whole time yes yeah. um and so i think that's why the rooms at gobekli tepe uh, seem to be you know broken up into smaller areas i suspect that it was probably just as vast as Garahan originally yeah i think <clears throat> here's a thought to keep in mind when you look at next looking at images of uh, gobekli tepe of the the special buildings what you're looking at is a site in disrepair and would have mm. been in disrepair back in back in the day mm. um, these folks have been for some time fighting a losing battle against the uh, the hill above uh, the the site uh, and uh, well also, probably the weight of their own endeavours creating a, a settlement further up the hill mm. because it was not stable. Mm. Um, and here's the point, you know, I suppose, where we can lay to rest one of the other uh, memes or uh, uh, common misconceptions. And I don't know when it started uh, um, exactly. And that is of the deliberate infill of these buildings and abandoned and abandonment of them yeah uh if ever there was you know we got it in our face that that was not the case <clears throat> was standing down there and you are you know i'll ask you to take over here Rupert, because <laughs> you're the one i was holding the camera yeah. you're the one that's standing with your you know with your finger <laughs> yeah with your yeah hand from um, time to time on the yes uh, the wall of fill of refuse not yes. the, not the wall of the, the not the built wall yeah but the 
the stuff that the archaeologists have had to be excavating through yes. to get to the the site. Yeah, so, it, so if Say you more. imagine that you've got the dry stone walls of the buildings uh, that, uh, that are the 10,000-year-old uh, buildings, but then you've got, mm. as Mike just said, you've got the... Uh, the edges of it's just where the archaeologists have been digging and excavating. So you're looking at these earth surfaces that they have just been troweling their way through. And I commented to Lee that just everywhere there were these fragments of bone. And he said, oh, yeah, there's bone all over the place. There's tons of the stuff. And and I just picked okay. out one little piece. And you could see that it was a piece of, it was probably duck or, or waterfowl of some description, just this little piece of bird bone. And, uh, and, you know, and I looked at that and I was just evaluating, you know, that's just, you know, somebody's tea. You know, somebody had a meal then. And I, uh, uh, and I put that in and I said, oh, look, there's another one. And I could see the edge of another piece of bone. And I pulled on this and this bloody great rib came out pork rib and yeah, and it, honestly it was just such uh it, and on one level it's a nothing but on another level it's but this is dinner the, you know this is uh, someone's eaten chicken or, or whatever that bird was and and yeah. someone's eaten pork ribs and uh it's just the fact that it's everywhere absolutely everywhere and what's happened is that over the millennia as the hillside has just been slowly creeping and creeping and creeping the way hillsides do and just been slumping down into the special buildings and it's just gradually been engulfing it. And so all these soils from centuries and centuries of inhabitation, you know, generation upon generation of people just putting their rubbish into middens and, and what have you. And this is all gradually, you can't even say tumbled, it's just slumped down into the site. And what for me was so exciting about that is that you can just randomly pull out a couple of pieces of bone that you can say, well, these, you know, this was dinner for somebody. But the point is that these two pieces of bone could have been dinners separated by a century. They've all just tumbled down. You know, they might have been in the, the same week or the same couple of days, but not necessarily. The way it's all tumbled, it could they could be, you know, decades apart. And I find that quite evocative. It's like being in a time machine, really. Mm. Mm. Uh, uh, extraordinary. What else about uh, being down amongst the, you know, actually in, in the buildings? And there, were so, there were so many details to take away, you know, not, not least of which, you know. But I'll tell you one of the big ones. sculptures. <clears throat> and the, go on. Well, one of the big ones is, you know, you mentioned it, that you're, when you're standing on the floor, you're standing on the bedrock. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and what was happening in my head was that, so when they started this, when they decided, let's live here, and uh, and and okay, so they were probably living in timber buildings to begin with for however long. We've got no idea. Could have been a thousand years. We've got no idea. Um, but um, when they actually decided, all right, let's build a special building here, and so they started cutting away, chipping away the bedrock, and they left standing proud the plinths on which they then erected the tea pillars. Mm. So they've got down to a level. They, they've clearly, they've had this, uh, the design is, is, is well in place. You know, they knew exactly how they were going to build this. So they've dug away the entire floor, leaving these two platforms standing. And they're, they're not very high, what, f five inches tall, roughly? Um, Chipped, uh, hammered away the, all, uh, the, the all, floor, yeah. All just hammered away. And then when you look around the rest of the site and you see the amount of carving on, uh, not on all the pillars, but certainly on most of the pillars at Quebec Tapi, more than we see at uh, at the other sites, uh, which are still carved, but not as lavishly. And yeah. uh, and you think, well, you're talking about millennia before metal tools. And mm. so they're using stone to carve stone. And, that you know, that 
you're obviously you're getting through an awful lot of stone because you're you're chipping it and breaking it as you go. So so your tools are breaking and you're replacing your tools on a regular basis. How long did that take? And when you look at the level of detail in some of them, particularly this, the, the 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 sculpture of the wild boar, you know, you think, mm. well, how did you do that? Just it's mm. so stunning in its detail. You think, how? How? Mm. It's just mm. breathtaking, utterly breathtaking. The sheer ingenuity and brilliance of that artistry. Oh, gosh, when it's that old. Yeah. Uh, and there are so many hints at um, the richness that we can't see now, or the potential mm. richness of carvings and things that we can't see now. Uh, for instance, uh, according to Lee, they have plenty of you know, freestanding animal carvings that they reckon were actually shaped to fit in some of the uh, existing uh, holes that have been drilled yeah, and would have occurred yeah. as stone gargoyles. Yeah. So they weren't carved. So they so they had uh, carvings that weren't carved out of the stone, but were carved separately. Then had special places where they could be inserted right round the walls. Mm. So if you take on board that the uh, the pig, calling the pig the wild boar. Um, mm. Uh, fr from uh, Building D, that he's got colour on him. Mm. Uh, what if, you know, a lot of the other, the rest of the site was painted, had colour? Yeah. Uh, and you, then you, the whole thing takes on another complexion. It really does. I, I must admit, I, one of the things that intrigues me there is that you can... Uh, you know, when you look at the wild boar, you know, and, and we know that it had red in its mouth and black on its underside, and and you could see how both of those colours could be achieved through easily acquired yeah. natural dyes. Um, mm. So, you know, you think, well, you know, what other colours could they have easily extracted, and how sophisticated was their, uh, <laughs> you know, their biochemical? Well, knowledge here, of, uh, here's the thing. I don't know. I don't know. Remember asking Lee this question: uh, Is there evidence for plastering of walls? Um, I, I I don't know. I can't remember because, of course, you asking that question takes me takes uh, my mind to our you know later visit to uh, Chatal Hoyuk. Yeah, yeah, where of course the, you you've um, uh, the colours you have available, which are majorly that red, ochery red, and and black, mm. they stand out, you know, yeah. on a white plaster wall. Yeah. yeah. So, oh my goodness, you know, you begin to wonder. Mm. While I talk about, you know, while I mention uh, Chatal Hoyek, you know, um, when we look at looking back to the domestic buildings, there wasn't that much to distinguish them because we are looking at buildings, domestic buildings, and the special buildings. Um, buildings that mostly seem to have been accessed through the roof. Yeah. And one thing that you'll find littering the whole whole site of these stone portal stones, which would have been set into the roof, supported, you know, on, I presume, on timber rafters of, of some sort, yeah. that would have provided the access um, into the rooms below mm. through the roof. Yeah. Um, well, Lee did say that uh, there was one of the buildings, uh, I don't remember which one, but one of the buildings at Gobekli Tepe that they were excavating where they found the uh, the negatives, if you like, of it. so where the timber oh, yeah. post, the, uh, the timber supporting posts had been in the soil. Uh, so that's quite an exciting thing to have found. I think one of the big surprises there really is when you – when you look at the size of some of the portal stones uh, and you think how heavy they must be uh, because, mm. you know, they're, they're, they're the size that, well, you, you know, they're the size of a trapdoor. If you've got a, a trapdoor in the floor and you drop down into your cellar or a trapdoor going up into your attic, that kind of size, yeah. But, yeah. but made out of stone, again, they're going to weigh – maybe not half a ton, but they're not going to be far off in, in some of these cases, sitting mm. on top of a timber roof. So clearly they're made, they're incredibly strong to be supporting that sort of weight, particularly when you think that there's 
going to be most likely there's going to be more than one uh, entry in or entry call it a a roof light if you like there's going to be more than one hole in the roof because they'll have been letting light down as well they wouldn't have just had one entrance mm. and nothing else and presumably and one of the big surprises for me was that uh, you you might have seen pictures of these portal stones and it it looks well it certainly did for us anyway it looks as if they you'd you'd have a a hole cut in your timber roof and you would slot this uh, this stone flanged. portal, yeah, a flanged, exactly that carved flanged. To the it, stone, it, yeah. it looks like yeah. that you would you would slot it into the hole in your roof, and the flanges would uh, w- would be overlapping at the top to stop it falling through. And it was uh, Benny, the other archaeologist uh, who was with us, who showed us pictures of no, and it was when we were at Carahan actually, and he showed us one yeah, yeah. of the uh, the portal stones there. It's broken and on its side, uh, but he was showing us that no, these are carvings, uh, and and so the carvings no, the the portal stones were actually they were the other way up from the way we'd been imagining it, and mm. these flanges in a lot of cases, they actually had intricate carvings of animals on them and you could use those as handles you know you could grab the animals uh you know so uh, as you lowered yourself down through the portal and that threw me completely because now i was having to completely oh, reimagine uh, how these uh, uh how these roofs were constructed uh it just yeah. i still find it's it incredible. question question remains you know why go, go to all that trouble making a stone portal when presumably you could have made it one out of timber, yeah, a much easier job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you Why? know, and the extra structural uh, strength that you need to support these uh, mm. very, very heavy, heavy pieces. Yeah. There, I suppose there would be an argument that maybe says that actually, if you put weight on a timber structure like that, it adds to its strength and security by stressing that's the, a good point actually you know, the timbers yeah. and, and, yeah. and you know forcing stuff to really jam up against each other by the application of weight it could be yeah. you know part of the structural that, integrity of uh, that is a good a point site. but uh, yeah. who knows yeah we'd have to ask an engineer that question yeah um yeah 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 i'll tell you something I, else also that was i've got in a, my mind yeah go on no, I've got in my mind uh, sort of what looked like little um, uh, the, the little recesses on the, on the floor. Uh, they look like little dog kennels, <laughs> which is sort of a very tempting way of, uh, you know. I, I, did they have dogs back then? Did they, were, were dogs in, in use back in... Uh, That's a good question, because... 9,500 BC? Uh, we do know that they, dogs were beginning to, and cats as well, I think, were beginning to be yeah. domesticated then or uh, domestication is going but, a bit a little bit far uh we yeah. they'd become but you wouldn't have had a, a you, there would no way would there have been a dog at that time that would have fitted in one of those That's i say this more by way punk. of <laughs> <laughs> i say this more by way of illustrating what you can see by yeah. rather than declaring that what that is what it must have been but if yes. you can imagine a sort of little a little dog kennel on the ground <laughs> and decorated with boars either side. You know, so well, yeah. were they? How were they hunting boar? Were they? Were they? You know, there's, they trained. There's, there's one in particular. Uh, I've got a photograph dogs. of you filming it, um, and it's Damn, one, of, see, one, little, of, <laughs> one of the little. Can't show it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one of the little niches um, at uh, at foot level. And uh, and there's a wild boar uh, over the top of the hole, and a fox on either side of it. And yeah. and clearly, you know, foxes and wild boars really were a thing for these Huge. people. They're just ubiquitous. Um, well, I was wondering if the foxes were actually dogs. Well, do you know? I mean, you, uh, let's you, move on. Let's, well, you, let's, but the yeah. thing is, you can domesticate a fox, though. Um, no, you, yeah, and I, I think anyway, it's sorry, also, getting, that's, that that would get us into the weeds. Um, it, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. I think that it's also it's stuff, important yeah. to make a point here, though, because you brought it up, so I'm not going to let it go. And that's that. <laughs> uh, one of the things that we mentioned before was that uh, uh, in previous podcast was that one of the things that really forced people to settle down 
was the fact that as soon as you can harvest or gather enough grain to support a family for a year, then you can't carry it around with you. You've got to have somewhere to store it. And as soon as you've got to store something, you've got to stay with it. Mm. So as soon as you're storing grain on any significant scale, you have a problem with mice and birds. And mm. and so I don't know when cats first mm. appeared in the domestic uh, scene. I don't think it was as long ago as that. But there is clearly a reason for mm. people to be welcoming predatory wild animals, uh, you know, or accepting them within their um, uh, the confines of their community, yeah. if you like, if they're going to be eating the uh, eating the mm. mice and frightening away the birds. So it, that's, a, that's a strong possibility for the niches on the ground. Place for the cats. Fair point. Fair point. Fair point. Yeah. <laughs> we shall never know. It's a yeah, tantalising little detail, though. But talking about details, you know, the, the carvings, if we spread the net a bit wide, can we talk about the consistency of um, iconography, shall I put it that way, the consistency mm. of the st- of stylistic consistency? Yes. Um, from, you know, we can only speak to the sites we've visited, uh, really, but, I mean, I, I think it's a sub topic and I think that's been expressed by archaeologists before that there is a unification you know of, mm. of style and uh, and themes yeah. um, in in what's portrayed uh, here and elsewhere mm. uh, well one of the standout details is that pretty much all the animals depicted are male uh you know uh, uh, you know genitalia yeah. is very very deliberately carved um and when you yeah. think that particularly if you look at uh, well say birch there's the uh, the <clears throat> the carving of the man standing between two leopards very proudly holding his um, bits for all to see and then you've got the carving that was dis- uh, that was uh, excavated at Karahan Tepe this year. That's a big statue yeah. of a man holding his bits. And then there's San Liofa Man, which, oh, how long ago did they find that? That he was the beginning of it all, wasn't he? Oh, that was yeah. decades ago that they found San Liofa Man, yeah. who, once again, tall statue holding his bits. Um, so it's very interesting that when you think of... Uh, all, all the other uh, instances of art in prehistory that we know about tend to be focusing on the female form as uh, as relevant to fertility. So we have the Venus goddesses and all this sort of stuff. Uh, but but here in this culture, it's very much uh, the uh, the the male aspect of fertility that is being displayed all over the place. Hmm. Uh, I found that quite an and interesting man, detail. Yeah, and man or men in relationship to nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, or in relationships, you know, there, there, are, there are no depictions of plants, are there? <laughs> not that I can, not that I know has been reported that's, that's or not. That's a good point, you know. actually. That is a good point. Yeah. Um, it is all animal, yeah. Yeah. Mm-mm. Mm. Um, but uh, an interesting uh, aspect, you know, again, ubiquitous stuff is that you you look at the at the statues, the most famous statues at uh, Gebekli Tepe, where the T pillars, however crude the design seems to be, the T pillars are people. Uh, you can see the the arms coming down, uh, you know, the bent arm coming down the side of the body on each side of the T pillar with the, their hands on their waist. Um, and mm. they do, when you look at the carvings of the animals, it, it does make you think that the carvings of the people are a lot more crude, but that's clearly that's as important as they thought it was. The point is that the pillars do represent people. And then you go to 
other places and say birch is a wonderful example where you've got the the low relief so it's on the inside of a bench where you've got the man between two leopards holding his bits and then alongside that who, you've who got, is uh, uh, let's just put that in con- context that the well the uh say birch a, man in yes. relief well he's How a little bit bigger he? than that is he? he but he's bigger than that is but, he, is uh, it, is it, yeah because if you think the two of us kneeling beside him it, so he's about two foot tall, eighteen inches to two foot tall, something like that. Half less yeah, than that's half generous, a meter. I think. Yeah, but yeah. Um, uh, but the, the 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 thing is that you've got those carvings, but then you go outside of this building because the the carvings at, at Saybirch are yes. underneath modern houses. Um, so yeah, when you know, it's, when we say modern houses, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't want to be rude to people's houses in the village of of Saybirch, but well, they're less uh, they're less than a hundred years old. They're a bit ramshackle. Let's just put it. Let's leave it at that. Yeah, <laughs> yes, they're less than yeah. a century old. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but the thing is that you go out into the uh, what do you want to call it? You just go outdoors, and there's, there's a court, courtyard. You know, like, it's like a sort of see, cross th- between a farm th- courtyard and a, and a garage. Something like that. Should we just call it a yard then? Because I I was avoiding a courtyard yard. because that yeah. made that made it sound a bit grander. Uh, but Grand. the, it's but an the un, point untidy is untidy yard, shall we say? Uh, but how tired is this place? That there is a yeah. gatepost for a gate that doesn't exist anymore. Um, yeah. but, but the point is that the gatepost is <laughs> a half of an old tea pillar. And uh, and when you start looking around this yard, you find that well that stone wall over there, well there's two T pillars on their sides making up most of that. And and when you look closely at them, you see that no, they're people as well. Look, you can see the arm uh, down the side the of that. The arm. And, and, and the hands uh, grasping uh, the, you know, in yeah, the same uh, style as uh, Quebec and, the, and the people that have that have built this now derelict um set of buildings you know they've just dragged these tea pillars out you know the, i mean this is stunning archaeology and they've just dragged it out and reused it and that tickled me because how many times in the past you know particularly with british archaeology that we've been looking at places and saying well that's reuse clearly that's come from somewhere else and clearly that's come from somewhere else and here we are standing in a farmyard where the, there's just tea pillars all over the place that have just been dragged out and used for something else i hope that kind of makes the point about the ubiquity of <laughs> tea pillar sites yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, talk about the one in the centre of uh, uh, San Lufa, for, for oh, example. Oh, Yanni, Ma- uh, uh, Yanni Mahale. Uh, um, yeah. No, Yanni Mahale. Um, I mean, you, you, there are two points that you like to make, you know, and that is the successful sites persist. And yes. also, it's another example of the ubiquity of tea pillar sites. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, there's, there's nothing to see there now, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, that it, 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 so this is right in the middle of uh, San Liefa, right in the middle of the city. And uh, it looks like a derelict building site. We, we went right up. There's a, a hill um, over mm-hmm. the uh, the city that you can... Oh, it, it uh, should say how far San Liefa is from um, uh, Gobekli Tepe itself. 20, 20, it 20, 20 miles, roughly. Is it 20 miles or 20 kilometres? It's something like that. 20 uh, kilometres, I think. 20 yes, kilometres, yeah. Not quite 20 miles. Um, and uh, so we climbed up this hill where there's a Roman, again, derelict, but there's a Roman fort on the top of this hill but from there you Mm. can look down over the city and you can see what looks like a derelict building site right in the middle and um that derelict building site is the site of uh yeni mahale which is uh, an old tea pillar site same age as gobekli tepe um and and it is that point of over time, settlements just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you want to be a purist about the information, you know, be really accurate about the information, then this T-pillar site, uh, it wasn't uh, permanently inhabited over thousands of years. It, it was abandoned uh, in favour of something close by. But the point is that we know that many sites were abandoned uh 
abandoned is probably the wrong word to use in these cases because uh, there can be all sorts of reasons why over time you might want to stop using a particular site. It might be because of a build-up of your own sewage. It might be because it's become uh, louse infested and uh, you know there's all sorts of reasons why you might want to move to something or cleaner. Might, you might have been losing fighting a losing battle about the uh, the hillside coming that, down yeah into also your, true that's yeah. a good point um so when uh, when you get the information that they know the site was abandoned the point is that it was abandoned in favor of something very close by so so once again when you're looking at things that are right in the middle of a city then you you still can apply that rule that a successful settlement does just get bigger and bigger over time. And we see so many instances of that, you know, whether it's, you know, Cairo, Jericho, it doesn't matter, you know, that these sites that, that you go back that period of time and mm. the land was so lush and giving that, mm. um, uh, you know, even it, it is, it's the proverbial Garden of Eden. It's no, it's mm. no mystery that is so deep, it's so deeply entrenched in global mythology, really. Yeah. And of course, there would have been settlements all over the place. And mm. those settlements that had access to the limestone bedrock with which to build their buildings made T-pillar sites. Yeah. Uh, and as insofar as that, to, um, uh, geological area is concerned. They, you know, they are the T pillar sites are there to be found. Gobekli Tepe is by no means alone. Heaven mm. knows, you know what other you know sites there are. Gobekli Tepe may be the largest of them. It might not. Only time will tell uh, in these instances, <laughs> yes. I guess. Uh, I, I think, it, I, I tell you what, p potentially, there, having been to Cajan Tepe, it's potentially bigger than Gebekli Tepe. Yes. Looking out over the landscape and seeing, you can see the yes. tops of tea pillars unexcavated that are still poking out. Yes. You know, looking like ordinary boulders, a lot elongated boulders in, in the landscape. Oh, look, a tea pillar over a tea pillar. It's yeah. extraordinary. It's so. Uh, it's quite. Uh, I, I don't want to say mind blowing. I don't. God, it's because that that makes the impression that it's a constant surprise. It's not that. It's it's the it's the information overload when you're walking across mm. a landscape and and you know that oh look here's another one and you know that that's going down at least ten feet three meters below your feet and possibly more. And and everywhere mm. you walk, it's like that. And uh, Gobekli Tepe is big, uh, 20 hectares. I can't remember how big Karahan is. Not quite so big, I don't think. Um, but okay. the point is you're still talking about roughly the same percentage of the site that's been excavated, 5 6 7%. It's never more than 7%. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and when you look at the sophistication of what they've found, bearing in mind that they only find them because of tea pillars They don't find them because mm. of domestic buildings, because the domestic buildings mm. aren't standing proud of the landscape. Uh, yeah. So uh, you just you can only guess at what is still remaining, yeah. waiting to be seen under Behind. the other 95%. And, and, of course, it is absolutely no surprise that the, you know, the, the special buildings are the ones that have been concentrated on mm. because it's the T pillars, the surface tops of the T pillars that have alerted archaeologists to where a site might be. So, where do you dig? You dig, dig down on the special building, and, and, yeah. and the site becomes about the special building, not the people that were living, <laughs> yeah. you know, just up, uh, you know, uh, around, around that. Yeah. So, look, you mentioned the word information overload, and <laughs> I think, you know, we. We were we were overloaded, and yes. we've done our best to unload uh, some of it in this this podcast. <laughs> I, I have a feeling that you know we've only scratched the surface, you know, indeed, uh, in so many areas. But we hope that's not too much info information overload for you lot out there to to take in, because believe me, there's more to come. Yeah, <laughs> but I hope that gives you a. A different flavour, perhaps, than you've taken on before. 
uh, about this uh, extraordinary sight, you know, seen through our eyes, uh, mm. obviously, uh, on the ground. But I can promise you <clears throat> we've got stuff uh, coming up which will be published on uh, on YouTube. So there'll be lots of pictures, lots of video to watch. Sorry, that, again, that uh, there will be. being there. Yeah. Uh, uh, concentrating on this being a podcast there's not much supportive material as far as that is concerned there will be though um, there will be but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, there's uh, stuff coming I mean the, it'll almost be the, I think one of the next things out will probably be almost the video version of, of this as y you I carry you with the camera through those three days and follow yeah. Rupert and I and and Lee through those buildings, so you can see with your own eyes the journey that we undertook and uh, the riches uh, that are on that site beyond yes. uh, the special buildings. And at that point, this point, I, have I to think say, it's I, time I, for I, us to wind up, Mr. Soskin. Yes, we do need to wind up, uh, and, but mm. I think it's a it's a point. Um, I, I, one of the things that I am so happy that we are able to do in oh, this yeah. is to uh, actually show people yeah. all that the domesticity and all this kind of stuff when you think how many books have been written on the basis of this was a temple and nobody lived here and and this was deliberately yeah. buried when no it wasn't uh, it's so nice to be able to um, actually have a reality check on that and uh, and get some of the real information out there mm -hmm. So, folks, uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. As I said before, uh, please do take a look at uh, uh, our Buy Me A Coffee page uh, if uh, you feel um, supporting Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge, the film series, uh, would be something you'd like to contribute to. Um, and also take a look at our Patreon page because, uh, you know, we've got a wonderful community there that also help us do what we do and... Uh, uh, keep uh, keep our motors running, <laughs> and there is a wealth of stuff on the Patreon site that is only there for patrons as well. It's uh, there's a lot for of sure. stuff on there. For sure. Yeah. yeah. So take a look. Uh, thanks a lot. If you do, look forward to uh, seeing you again um, very very soon. Um, so that's it for now. Yeah. Uh, till the ne next time. It's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from me. You take care, folks. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.